Welcome everybody. Um, this is the Ideas to Award presentation for the Marvin Gaye Recreation Center. We have with us today the project team that will be sharing um, with you about their work um, and how this project came about. So really excited for this today. Um, you will notice that a couple of housekeeping items uh, that everybody's webcam and mics are enabled. We ask that right now you turn them all off, turn off your webcam, turn off your mics. We want to let the speakers actually be able to take center stage. So please be aware of that. Um, if at any point you have any issues with connection, um, we would say the easiest thing to do is just kind of close Zoom and reopen it. Uh, but if you have any trouble, still feel free to shoot um, a message over to us and we'll try to get you reconnected as soon as possible. So this is a AISC AIA approved course. Uh, so for those of you who are joining us, um, please be aware this is, um, you will have to be registered or logged on for 45 minutes to receive credit for this. So please do your best to be on the full amount of time so that we you can gain credit for this. Uh, like I said before, this is a presentation that will allow you to you know, see what was put into um, putting together this project. So everything from the innovative design to the unique challenges that this um, project team had to face in putting, um, putting this project together. There are a few uh, learning objectives for today. Um, we will learn how you know, structural steel is used by designers and builders um, to provide solutions. Um, attendees will also learn how uh, all the sustainable benefits of structural steel, um, how is steel, uh, exposed steel able to accomplish structural goals, as well as how um, the delivery of this unique project um, was very important to the health and community uh, of, and environment. All right, so this uh, presentation today will begin with the project team sharing about um, the building, and then we will have a very brief award um, ceremony for it. And then we will conclude by having a Q&A session that will be moderated by AIC and iStudio. And with that, I'll let Marissa go ahead and take, take off with it. Awesome. All right. Thank you, Stacey. Um, so again, everyone, thank you so much for joining for today's presentation on Marvin Gaye Recreation Center. Uh, my name is Marissa King. I'm a project architect um, with iStudio Architects. Um, I'm going to give a brief introduction of just all the presenters, um, kind of the panelists you'll be hearing from, as well as a little bit of context um, about the project, and then we'll dive right in um, to the exciting part of the presentation. So today you'll be hearing from four panelists, um, myself, Marissa King, again with iStudio Architects, um, Paul Blackman Jr., who is the Deputy Director um, for DC's Department of General Services Capital Construction Division. Um, he's on the client side. Um, Matt Dow is with Simpson, Gumpert, and Heger. He's the structural engineer for the project. Um, and then last but certainly not least is Frank Leffler um, with MCM Build, a contractor on the job. Um, so to give you a little bit of context, before we jump into the project. Um, oh, there we go. Um, just to, for those of you that are potentially outside the region, um, Marvin Gaye Recreation Center is located in the District of Columbia. Um, we see we've highlighted the National Mall. It's kind of centrally located, if you will, um, in DC. Um, if you basically go due east from there, hop across the Anacostia River, um, you'll see that little pink diamond, if you will. That's our site. Um, this is located in Ward 7. Um, it's primarily a residential neighborhood, um, single family housing, um, some multifamily housing, um, but a very different feel from, from kind of downtown DC if anyone's been to the National Mall or kind of that area. Um, this area is again, very residential. Um, it's a really strong community. They host multiple events throughout the year. They have a Marvin Gaye Day where they um, open up a big park and have a lot of activities for kids. Um, they have a basketball tournament once a year that hosts thousands of people that come to watch um, these really great basketball players. Um, so it's definitely a very rich, vibrant kind of community. 
Um, it's also the birthplace of Marvin Gaye. So hence the name Marvin Gaye Recreation Center. Um, this is where he was born um, and had his first um, childhood years, if you will. Um, this area is also um, an area that's lacking in resources. Um, so Ward 7 is known as a food desert. Um, what that means is that for the entire ward, um, there are three grocery stores um, for all of the residents in that ward. To put that in comparison, um, other parts of DC, different wards will have 50 to 60 grocery stores um, for the same number of residents. So it's definitely an area where these community centers, um, these recreation centers are a very crucial part um, of being able to kind of help bridge that gap um, and give you know, some more much needed resources to the community um, to help them with some of the great programs that they're already doing. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Paul Blackman Jr., um, who can talk a little bit more about um, why these projects are so important to um, DC um, and the Department of General Services. Thank you. Thank you, Marissa, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Marissa stated, I'm Paul Blackman Jr., Deputy Director uh, of Capital Construction for Department of General Services, also known as DGS. On behalf of Director Keith Anderson and the Capital Construction Services Division, we're honored to receive AISC's Merit Award in Steel Design. This is a terrific honor for us and the Marvin, Marvin Gaye Recreation Center project team. Thank you. DGS is the construction arm for the District of Columbia for all its real estate. And we often work with organizations such as iStudio MCN Build and SGH. We're very pleased to be receiving this award alongside these organizations. It was a great team effort. DGS's mission is to build, maintain, and sustain the real estate assets owned by the District of Columbia. Right now, that's approximately 840 properties across all eight wards of the city. These include hospitals, public safety facilities, schools, and park and recreation facilities. Implementation is at the core of our mission, getting the projects constructed. Part of sustaining these properties is the critical piece of building and a resilient building structure and even a ground structure so the generations to come can enjoy these spaces that we are designing today. What does the resilience mean in DC? What is DC's plan and strategy? So resilience is the capacity of individuals, communities, institutions, businesses and systems within a city to survive, adapt and grow in spite of any chronic stresses and or acute shocks they may experience. For DC, it means we're looking at every corner of our portfolio from the building rooftops to building controls to search for ways to build in energy, I mean efficiency, excuse me, and resilience. DC has a strategy called Resilient DC that will help the city face the challenges that may come including those from the environment. The vision is to have the city become climate resilient and carbon neutral by 2050. The resilient DC strategy was launched last year, but a lot has happened before that, including when DC was named in 2016, selected to join the 100 Resilient Cities Network. In 2017, DC was named the first lead platinum city in the world and we're already pushing toward net zero resilience efforts in our work that will serve DC residents. A major example of this is our Community Renewable Energy Facility, home to 7,200 solar panels that will provide DC residents with lower electricity bills. DGS is finalizing installation of a 2.65 megawatt community solar facility on a 15-acre brownfield site called Oxen Run. The project is expected to reduce electricity costs by $500 per year for more than 750 low-income households surrounding the Ward 8 quadrant of the district. And we're continuing to navigate resilience in real time as we respond to the COVID-19 pandemic and its relation to our school facilities, our medical facilities, and our office building. Why is DGS building community centers and how do they serve the community? DGS shares a great connection with our client agencies, including Department of Parks and Recreation, which provide program services at community centers we build and maintain. 
DGS constructs, the, constructs these centers based on needs of the community and industry standards. Community centers very often serve as the focal point or anchor of a neighborhood. They are important places that serve many purposes. As populations grow and people become more engaged, community centers are available to provide programming for all ages and services of many types. Community centers are also place, a place to gather to discuss issues of importance to community members. They can also be activated to serve as cooling, warming, and or feeding centers in emergencies. Strategy for building the project. We appreciate this recognition because we are also very proud of Marvin Gaye Recreation Center, not only for the iconic musical artist it's named after who was born and raised in the city, but also because of the thoughtfulness of the design. It's a public hub strategically designed to be built on a floodplain. That's ingenuity. This iconic center replaces an old recreation center that was a small one-story brick building not meeting the needs of the, of the agency DPR or the community. Now there's a community room, a teaching kitchen, tech lounge, a senior room with a floating balcony. Resilience was built in to include screens to control daylighting and solar heat gain, a green roof, and a design that provides minimal impact to the existing site. It's the city's first center with integrated natural ventilation. We are seeing that this type of strategic planning, forward thinking, and building in of resilient innovations are more important than ever. If needed after a natural disaster, this location can serve as a potential shelter. My biggest takeaway from the project, when we are challenged, we can often find solutions where we have not ordinarily been looking. The Marvin Gaye project was a push toward innovation in that it was great design in the artwork using metal panels, there's a memorable dedication to the local artist, Marvin Gaye. Artwork depicting and recognizing Gaye throughout the facility. An inspirational location that provides and includes a music room for the community. And it also sets an example of what we can, should, and will continue to do to make impacts in all areas of the city, regardless of the socioeconomic makeup of the community. And you heard some of that in Marissa's earlier remarks uh, of the stark differences uh, with this community versus others uh, related to the food desert. And DGS measures success through many factors, including properties to provide for longevity and wellness for occupants, cost efficiency like the Oxen Rum Project, and the support and growth of the local economy. Our buildings can create, help us to create a stronger, more resilient infrastructure. Looking to the future, our buildings will need to work smarter to absorb some of the unexpected and unforeseen stressors we're faced with and balance these items and contribute toward an improved quality of life. Thank you again for this honor and I'm gonna turn it back to Marissa. Great, thank you, Paul. Um, and as a quick side though, um, just to let everyone know um, during the presentation, um, if you have questions, we welcome them. So please um, type them in the chat bar. Um, and then at the end of this presentation, um, we'll have a time um, for all four panelists um, to kind of, you know, read through those questions and answer them um, as much as time allows. Um, so to jump back into um, the design portion of this, um, as Paul said, you know, these, these recreation centers are really designed for the community that they are located in. Um, so just the first point um, is really making sure that the community is part of that design process. Um, this included multiple community meetings, um, garnering their feedback, you know, from concept the whole way through design, because at the end of the day, we want a building um, and we want an end project where um, it meets their programmatic needs and they are happy and proud um, and kind of take it on as their own. Um, the first step with that, um, there we go, um, is understanding the existing site conditions. Um, so with that, um, we have a site plan. This is the, the final site plan, if you will, with the new recreation center. Um, I'm going to quickly talk through what the existing conditions were and then how that kind of drove the design. Um, so to start, 
in the northwest corner, kind of up near Banks Place and 61st Street corner, there was a playground that was designed and built about a year prior to when we started design. This was actively used by the community. They loved it. Um, even during construction, we purposely put that outside of the construction zone um, to make sure that the community could still use it um, throughout the entire time um, the project was being built. So we knew that that would just be incorporated into our end um, site plan um, at the end of the project. Um, in the center of that north portion of the site, um, kind of just below that neighborhood plaza, that's where the existing field house that Paul was talking about was located. This just had one community room, um, some restrooms and an office. And this was the only interior space um, that the neighborhood had to host any kind of after school event or meeting um, or anything that they would want to do during inclement weather. Um, to the right of that, you have some basketball courts. Um, again, these were very popular, um, were a high demand um, from the community. So we knew we had to keep those basketball courts um, and the existing willow oaks um, that were very mature and provide a lot of shade in that area. Um, if we hop across that stream, that's Watch Branch Stream, we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but on the south side of the site, there is an existing softball diamond, um, an outfield, and then a large green space kind of connected to that. Um, that was used for little league practices, a place just for kids in the community to run around. Um, this being an urban site, having that much green space um, in a neighborhood is really desirable. Um, it was probably one of our top requests from the community was to keep as much green space as possible because they use it so often. Um, the other things you'll see on this site plan are a few dashed lines. So the first one I want to point out um, is that dashed line that snakes across kind of the outfield of the softball um, area. That's the 100-year floodplain that Paul was talking about. Um, so what that told us is that you know 50 percent, 50 or more percent of our site was located within the 100-year floodplain, we knew we'd have to deal with that from concept. Um, the two other dash lines um, kind of run parallel on either side of Watch Branch Stream. Um, this is the floodway zone. So basically what that is, is a FEMA designated riparian zone um, for all intents and purposes. Um, whoops, my apologies. There we go. Um, this essentially was a do not build area. Um, we couldn't touch or modify anything in that area, and that's really to protect the stream um, and to protect the adjacent banks um, in the event of a large flood or storm. Um, so what did this mean? It meant we had a lot of existing um, site conditions that were important to the community, um, as well as environmental factors um, that really kind of gave us the challenge for where to locate this building. You can see the diagrams on the right-hand side of this page kind of are you know, a cartoon sketch, if you will, of our stock process. So number one is, you know, find a compact two-story building and tuck it as close to that floodway as possible without actually touching the floodway. Um, since we're in the 100-year floodplain, we then have to build that up about five and a half feet above grade to get it out of the flood, um, above the base flood elevation. Um, after that, we took that second story and we cantilevered it out getting it closer to the stream and also opening up the program spaces on the interior side. Um, and then number four is that kind of crowning jewel, if you will, um, of an outdoor balcony. So giving the community a nice new unique perspective up among the trees with the creek below, being able to see both sides of the site. Um, so here um, you'll see what the end result kind of really was. Um, it was a very site specific building um, that really led to a very kind of dynamic, engaging um, building on the interior and exterior, if you will. So a series of slope pathways um, that allowed the community to kind of run around, have fun with it on the outside, um, and helped achieve all those environmental factors that we had to kind of mitigate um, during design. The other thing you'll see um, in this image is that large green perforated screen. So this, um, I'll say, is probably one of our big design moves. Um, and so as such, um, being a public building, we needed to make it do a lot of things. Um, so number one, it's, all, it's just a building marker, if you will. Um, that signage for Marvin Gaye Recreation Center, nice and high. So as people across the street at the Metro Center are kind of exiting the uh, Metro Station, they can see Marvin Gaye Recreation Center bright and clear because it's so high on this nice um, large green screen. Um, this screen is also providing mechanical um, screening for us, which is a requirement by zoning. 
Um, but probably two of the best um, things that we're having the screen do are some of our passive strategies. So you can see um, from the image that will be popping up soon um, that we're using this to help um, reduce our solar glare. So this is allowing um, us to have nice, large open windows. Um, since it is such a small building, we really wanted to open it up as much as possible. Um, this screen is allowing us to have filtered light to have a nice consistent daylighting um, effect throughout the entire building. Um, it's also calculated into all of our energy models. It helped us to reduce our solar heat gain and again, bring down our energy loads, um, which helped us achieve lead goals for this building. The other um, thing I'd like to point out in this image are these three operable windows that you see right in the, um, that large opening a piece of glazing. These operable windows um, are incorporated in strategic places throughout the building um, and they're tied to our natural um, passive ventilation system, which again, Paul talked about. So what this is, um, again, operable windows um, in the program spaces with an indicator light um, that turns on when the weather station on the roof says conditions are right. That tells someone they should open the window because it's really nice out. Um, as they open that window, the mechanical system goes into passive mode. Um, solar powered exhaust fans, which are number four up on the roof, kick on. So we're drawing cool air in low where the people are and then exhausting that hot stale air out through the roof. Um, you can see keynote number five on the right hand of the building um, in the circulation spaces where people are more so coming and going. Um, we took it out of a person's hand to open and close the window um, and tied it into automated louvers so that the building automation system would automatically open and close the louvers as needed. Um, my favorite example of this is opening day of the recreation center hundreds of people coming in and out um, to see their new recreation center from the community. Um, it was a beautiful day in May and the building was entirely operating in this passive mode um, and you couldn't tell it felt great in the building. Um, the next point I like to bring up is on art and the incorporation of art um, to celebrate Marvin Gaye, but also to celebrate the community itself. So we worked with a local DC artist um, to incorporate these two large murals, one on each floor of the building. Um, and they're really a collage of um, images of Marvin Gaye throughout his career and throughout his life um, in the area, as well as notable buildings um, through the district and in this neighborhood in particular um, that residents would be able to recognize um, as, they, as they walk through the space. Um, the important thing is that we, incorporated um, or intended for these murals to be designed um, from schematic design. So we intentionally kept these large open glass windows on the interior space, knowing that these murals would be applied um, so that we'd have this nice kind of rich dynamic um, privacy, but still being able to see through um, throughout, the, throughout both the first and second floor. Um, and then lastly, bringing it back to the biophilic principles um, of really just giving the community a nice new um, vantage point of their of their site um, and of their recreation center. So again, having this balcony literally up among the trees with the stream below um, was just a really kind of nice moment that we were able to give back to the community. Um, as Paul talked about his biggest takeaway, mine's very similar. It's um, it's taking the challenges you have with whatever project or site you're given um, and really turning them into an opportunity. For us, um, there were very challenging um, site-specific items that we had to overcome. Um, and I think ultimately it was working closely with our consultant. Um, and then once um, the contractor was on board, working closely with MCM Build um, and their subs to make sure that we had a well-planned out building. Um, and all of that, I would say, steel was a huge factor. It really allowed us um, to do some dynamic things um, where you can see with the engaging kind of angled columns as well as that perforated metal screen. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Matt Dow, again, um, the structural engineer for the project. Okay, all right, everybody, everybody can see that. So yeah, I, I, I wanna talk a little bit about the uh, challenges and opportunities uh, on this project and, and then have some, uh, some 
takeaways at the end uh, regarding the structural system. Uh, before I do that, I do want to acknowledge uh, the, the engineers who had helped me uh, make this project happen. You know, Tom Donnelly uh, did some exceptional engineering throughout the project. Tom uh, uh, worked uh, with me in the, the DC office of Houston Hood at the time, uh, since acquired by Simpson, Gumperts, and Hager. We're all now STH. And then uh, Tianjing Wang, who uh, helped see this project through construction. It was a very uh, complicated construction process and I uh, uh, really appreciate uh, Tianjing's uh, help on this project. Um, it, uh, Marissa went through some of the, you know, I think some of the unique attributes of this project, the, the screen wall, which uh, is a very important feature. Uh, I'll, I'll get into that in a minute. I, I think uh, one of the, the big challenges early on in this project was dealing with uh, building a building in the floodplain, um, the, the approach of cantilevering the building uh, over the, over the uh, area of concern was an initial strategy. Which you know, obviously we have a project with a with a budget, um, with, with an extremely tight budget and schedule, uh, no less. And so the approach we ended up taking was uh, to be able to cantilever the ends uh, ends of the building uh, over the floodplain, but also we were able to incorporate new foundations to, to carry uh, uh, some of that building in the, in the floodplain. Uh, initially, uh, you know, move to the next slide. Initially in our foundation concepts, uh, the bottom image uh, on the bottom right, uh, we had a pile supported system um, uh, uh, to be able to counteract the concerns over scour and erosion uh, of the soil. Uh, and not have uh, uh, not create an instability in the building structure. Uh, fortunately, we were able to work together with A. Morton Thomas, who did an incredible uh, uh, scour line study, and they were able to help us value engineer the building structure, remove the pile systems, which uh, of course were very expensive and you know, very difficult to have access to uh, to construct. Uh, we were able to go with a, a shallow foundation system. Uh, they, they helped us establish the elevation with which we could set the the uh, spread footings you know, you know, below that uh, scour line. So it meant digging a little bit deeper to get these footings in place. Um, we were able to do a much more economical foundation design. The foundations themselves were connected by a perimeter grade beam uh, in that area where the where scour was was a concern. The rest of the building you know, to the uh, to the uh, west, which is left on the page. Were primarily shallow, standard shallow uh, foundation systems, uh, and created this plinth on the left side uh, when we got uh, to the upper elevations, which were uh, which got us out of that scour zone. Now uh, these are just some details. Of, uh, the image on the right is the we've got these featured slope uh, steel columns which sit on piers. Uh, they they uh, then are connected by perimeter grade beams uh, and are supported on, on the spread footings. Uh, the, the, the building itself had an extre extreme lateral challenge. You know, obviously creating uh, these sloped columns induces, a, a, you know, I'll, I'll say a significant P delta effect and you know, lateral loads on the building and at the foundation level were extreme. And so uh, we were able to connect them all together with this grade beam system and essentially incorporate the these slope columns into the lateral system of the building, which which gave us an incredible efficiency. Um, at you know, the second floor level, the, you know, the, there's only one uh, framed floor on the on the east side, which is you know, fairly small in footprint, but uh, that consisted of uh, concrete slab on metal deck. It was uh, a three and a quarter lightweight concrete on on a two inch composite deck. Um, the Roof on lower roof on the, the bottom of the page was uh, tight consisted of type B metal deck, which carried an extensive green roof system. Uh, overall, the lateral system in the building uh, was somewhat complicated, but consisted of a, a central uh, reinforced masonry core. And then uh, on the uh, east end, the right right of the page, we had brace frames up and down on the page. On the left end of the building, the, the west end, we had a pair of moment frames uh, that reached across across the building um, so it, it was a, in, in the end a very uh, uh, you know, complex uh, lateral system but uh, when we we began analyzing the overall structure um, we were able to actually take advantage of these slope columns which which created an incredible stiffness uh, in the overall building's lateral system 
Um, at the upper roof level, this, uh, the left side, the sort of left half of the building, the, 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 the west end, uh, this is where the mechanical, uh, the mechanical penthouse is situated. Uh, that, uh, uh, those units sit on, sit on dunnage and, and sit on uh, a simple metal deck roof system. And on the right side, we have uh, an elevated roof, uh, roof system, which is also uh, framed with you know, you know, light, light uh, steel and, uh, and uh, type B metal roof deck. Uh, this is an elevation uh, along one of the two spines of the building that have the sloped columns. You can see a brace frame on the left and then uh, the sloped columns on the right, which uh, obviously added, added an interesting architectural feature, but they, they have the added benefit of creating this incredibly stiff lateral system in the east-west direction. And so this is a, uh, an image shortly after, uh, right around the time of topping out of the structural steel, so you get a good picture overall um, I, I think a, you know, it probably looks more uh, simplistic um, in, in this image, um, uh, and uh, I think it, it really came together in a, in a, in a, in a way that I, I think the structure was incredibly efficient. We have the cantilevers on the right side, uh, the, the upper roof and lower roof. Uh, you see at the corners of the upper roof, they're connected with vertical struts, and the reason for those or to ensure compatibility between deflections of the two, the two cantilevered systems. Uh, the building is rung with a curtain wall system up, up at that upper floor. Uh, so we had uh, significant challenges with keeping the structural behavior in, in, in line with the, uh, the, the jointing of the uh, curtain wall system. Um, bottom, bottom of the page on the right, also you see the, see the light colored steel columns. We, we ended up using hot dip galvanizing to protect the exterior steel columns, uh, which are exposed to the weather and elements. As those columns extend up and project into the building enclosure, uh, we had used a, basically a, a thermal break, uh, uh, Fabrica uh, bearing pads uh, to provide a ther thermal, uh, prevent thermal bridging and provide a good thermal break. Um, and uh, uh, that was something that we were able to detail through you know, during the construction process with the fabricator when they ultimately selected the uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, thermal break product. Um, the interior of the building, most of our projects traditionally, it's, it seems the, the structure gets gets uh, covered and we don't get to display it. In this case, the uh, majority of the, the structural system remained exposed and you know, it was really part of the feature of the building. Um, you know, this being a design build project, uh, fortunately, we were able to do this very economically and you know, I think with uh, yeah, minimal AESS specification, you know, just having the contractor on board with the philosophy of exposing the steel and, you know, taking care during fabrication and erection, knowing that this will all get painted and exposed, uh, I think is a really a great strategy to end up you know, using exposed steel um, without spending uh, a fortune. Um, and if, you know, finally, the discussion about this, the exterior uh, sunshade, uh, you know, the, the sunshade itself, um, it, you know, consists of vertical mullions, uh, uh, six foot spacing. The mullions were, uh, uh, were manufactured using aluminum uh, systems and the mullions the, themselves and, the, and the, the screen wall themselves ended up being a delegated design for this project. And, you know, this being a design build project, we made as a team made the decision to go that route, and you know, it really was a it was a an economic decision to provide uh, a much less costly, uh, fairly efficient uh, 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 exterior skin system. Um, it, it definitely created some confusion and a lot of you know, coordination between the main, the base building structural frame and and the. Uh, uh, and the, the, the shade uh, system. Uh, so you know, during uh, uh, construction and the submittal process, um, there, there was a lot of collaboration between between all parties. Um, you know, the the uh, the fact that the screen wall has a bit of a slope to it, around five degree uh, five degree slope, with all of the mullions uh, tilted, uh, you know, in uh, in concept seems very simple, um, but uh, geometrically it became very uh, complicated. Um, so this is a, a shot. You can see the see the the uh, the green uh, sun sunshade. 
Uh, and essentially, it's, it rests on the second floor level um, as far as vertical support, and then lateral support is taken into the upper roof level um, with lateral struts. Um, a bit of a complexity is that skin wraps around the building and uh, to the to the west or left, and then extends down and and does does support off of the the, the foundation level. Um, we had significant issues or concerns with with compatibility and you know allowing deflection of the of the, the superstructure to occur without damaging the skin system. Uh, so this was a model of the you know, from the fabricator, and this was of the superstructure. And um, the image on the right, this is looking up through the the back side of the of the sunshade, and it is, you can see the horizontal struts which reach out and grab the the skin system. Uh, the, you know, the bottom struts are carrying vertical load. The upper struts carrying lateral load. Um, what is seemingly seemingly a very simple idea, very very simple. Uh, concepts, uh, you know, I, I think became very, very complicated because of two, you know, having two separate fabricators uh, you know, manufacturing those systems. So it, it became a, a challenge during construction. We had a lot of meetings with between iStudio and, and MCM Build and, and their, their fabricators uh, to, to be able to, to help uh, make this uh, uh, come together. Um, the sketch on the left is a sketch that iStudio I provided. Uh, early on in that in that process, just to help ev get everyone on board with the complexities of the system, you see the the superstructure on the left, uh, which is designed to carry these outriggers, which are which are also thermally broken. Then they reach out further and grab the aluminum frame system. Um, so a lot of a, a lot of moving parts on this, but yeah, uh, in uh, uh, in, in concept, uh, a very, very simple idea. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'll, I'll let uh, uh, Frank discuss a little further. Um, you know, that there, certainly that was one main challenge uh, of the project. And I would say a key takeaway uh, from, our, from our end structurally, I think if we could do it all over again, we probably would have tried to avoid delegating the, this uh, screen wall system um, and maybe had a little bit more control and, and uh, um, responsibility over the, uh, the overall design. So Frank, I'll let you take it away. Uh, thank you very much, Matt. I see. Thank you, Matt. Um, yeah, again, my name is Frank Leffler, uh, project executive with uh, MCN Build. And what I want to do is walk you through a little bit of the perspective, uh, and help gain some perspective from the design builders' uh, perspective, um, kind of uh, giving the overall overview of uh, the project. Um, a lot of uh, what we discussed thus far is focused heavily on the building, but I kind of want to put it in the larger context. Um, understanding that when we mobilize to the site, um, uh, Going into this neighborhood, we had to understand that we were going to impact a lot of the active neighborhood uh, amenities. Um, that included the existing rec center uh, that was discussed earlier, about a thousand square foot single story building, uh, as, as well as the basketball courts and the football and baseball field. A couple of uh, uh, complexities surrounding these. If you can see here, um, these large trees. So the existing uh, rec center was roughly in this location here. Um, and a lot of these large trees are heritage trees that had to be uh, protected and maintained throughout the uh, course of construction. So uh, the existing rec center had to largely be uh, demolished by hand uh, because the roots of this tree had kind of grown into the foundation and we had to uh, take care to turn out to damage the tree um, so that it would be, so it remained a perpetuity for the residents. Um, additionally, these are the basketball courts. Uh, they're refurbished at this point, our brand new courts, and we added this court uh, as well on this side. This is the north side of the Milwaukee uh, Branch Street. Um, these courts are the courts that held the, uh, uh, the tournament that Marissa alluded to earlier. Again, this, uh, this tournament happens every July and uh, frequently gets as many as five or 6,000 uh, attendees. Um, so understanding that that was a heavy part of the fabric of this community and the, and the use of this rec center. 
Um, there's a lot of upfront coordination with uh, between MCN, DGS, and DPR in terms of timing to, to make sure that we minimize the impact on all these amenities as we move forward. Um, additionally, uh, the work for the project, um, again, here, here on the south side of the Water Stream Branch was uh, the majority of the new construction, the new build that we've discussed about, but there was the entire north side of the site with the basketball courts and the new entry plaza. Um, additionally, that's all located down here um, at the uh, Banks Place in 61st. However, uh, the rest of the project did span several miles all the way up the uh, Marvin Gate Trail and Park. Uh, we did have some work at what, what was known as Hub 1, Hub 2, and Hub 3, uh, adding uh, new amenities such as uh, um, gardens uh, uh, here, as well as some uh, exercise equipment at Hub 2 and a new floral garden at Hub 3, um, as well as uh, later on in the project, DPR uh, requested and we added a, a new splash park adjacent to the Hub 2 site. So, um, certainly being spread out across all these uh, areas uh, contributed to logistics uh, coordination efforts uh, and maintaining uh, those sites. Um, Marissa uh, spoke earlier about the floodplain issues. Um, again, with the biophilic design, the, the uh, project uh, sought to get as close to the stream as possible, uh, but based on scour and of course the, uh, the floodplain itself or the, the, uh, the floodway, um, we had to keep all construction out of the actual floodway, um, which really kind of necked down the site, uh, which is an otherwise open site, but knowing, understanding that most of the uh, mechanical systems and electrical systems are on the far east end of the building, but being fed from, the, from 61st Street over here, it created a bit of a challenge in, in routing uh, all the storm lines, uh, new water, gas, and, uh, and electrical services as well. Um, so that was a challenge up front. Additionally, there was a, uh, um, some archeological artifacts discovered on the site down in this corner over here, um, which uh, certainly complicated the permitting process up front um, and led to some relocation of uh, some storm structures that had to be installed uh, over here uh, out of the spillway and away from the artifacts. Uh, and then finally, the public space work um, up here in Minnesota, or at the Hub 3 location, we had to do new utility tie-ins for water service. Um, and uh, anybody that knows this area of the city understands that the Minnesota Ave is a main artery that serves this whole area. So the coordination uh, and permitting of that process for the road shutdowns and traffic control measures um, was, a, was a large challenge. Um, getting back to some of what Matt was talking about, the uh, coordination uh, with fabrication up front. Um, as you mentioned, several of the systems did uh, take a, a considerable amount of coordination. Uh, I think one of the things that you saw as Matt was going through his uh, drawings, or I should rather say one of the things that you did not see was a lot of uh, right angles, a lot of uh, straight lines and right angles. Uh, the building has uh, with, the, uh, with the skewed or sloped columns as well as uh, he mentioned that five degree tilt to the, uh, the frame. Um, again, as he mentioned, simple in concept and in the execution, there's a lot of detail that goes into that. So uh, hours and hours spent uh, working on the perforated metal, uh, metal screen design. Um, certainly understand his comments in terms of, uh, from a structural perspective, I think it did sort of complicate having two competing uh, engineering uh, desires for one, one to maintain uh, the lighter structure on the outside, but then coordinating with, with the building structure. However, I think just economically and feasibly um, for the uh, contract method, um, it really made uh, the execution of that work possible um, and really allowed that uh, this building to, to have what it ultimately became a very elegant solution to the, uh, the shading and the mechanical screening um, that I think all of us would agree uh, turned into a pretty fantastic uh, design. And look, a couple of the other things that we did coordinate um, that up front uh, was the power feeds to the rec center and basketball courts. Initially, it was envisioned that the north side of the site would be fed from the south side of the site. Uh, but through some uh, coordination with the engineering team, um, we determined uh, it, was, uh, it would be a large cost savings to the project um, to split those services. Uh, so we pursued that. Uh, 
and ultimately allowed uh, the uh, project to save well over six figures on that approach. Uh, again, the foundation systems, and I alluded to the scour, um, the foundations being in the floodplain, uh, had to, uh, we had to go through multiple iterations to ultimately determine what was the most economical approach that ultimately re uh, resulted in the spread and footer and uh, grade unit approach, uh, mad detail. So that was a huge win for the design team as well. Uh, and then of course, um, steel, you know, with all the angles um, and the hours that we spent uh, pouring over the drawings and ensuring that uh, everything was uh, set up correctly on paper um, and, and really just ensuring that this, uh, this project came to, to fruition successfully. Um, that sort of led to uh, the problem solving with uh, the field, in the field with the design team. Um, again, speaking on steel coordination, uh, what, what works on paper doesn't always work uh, in execution. So we did run into a few uh, locations where I think, uh, as you saw a lot of these connection plates, um, it was sort of a very unique connection where you're, you're connecting um, W-shaped beams into uh, tube shapes that are at different angles. Um, so uh, I think the execution of those connections, you know, you got to give kudos to Matt and his team for all the hours they spent out in the field working with our fabricators to ensure that um, those what ultimately ended up being, you know, extremely custom designed uh, connections uh, were executed properly um, to allow the, the building to happen. Um, again, the coordination with the screen walls, uh, um, once we got through the paper uh, analysis, uh, when we went out to execute in the field, a lot of the coordination with the uh, infrastructure of the building and the mechanical and electrical components by the time that was um, coordinated, um, that put some of the structural supports inside the building in conflict uh, and led to uh, some field applied solutions for waterproofing and thermal barrier. As you mentioned, some of the, uh, the screen walls uh, were supported off of the second story. Uh, which also supported the green roof in that area. So coordinating those two and ensuring that um, the envelope integrity was maintained uh, took, took some uh, field ingenuity, I'll say. So. Um, and then finally, the, uh, the evolving finish uh, selections. So about the time that the Marvin Gaye Rec Center was uh, looking to deliver, um, DPR uh, was evolving its standards for uh, the finishes in the, uh, the rec centers in, the, in this region. Um, and so at the last minute, I um, uh, got together with the iStudio team, uh, walked the site, and, and as well as DGS and DPR, and really coordinated uh, what finishes had uh, availability, but uh, still maintained their new standards. And we were really able to uh, find what we think is an elegant solution. Uh, with lessons learned overall, um, early engagement with the power utilities, I think that's probably a lesson that gets learned uh, on a lot of projects, uh, this was no exception. Uh, ultimately, the, the power on both sides of the site ended up being the linchpin for the schedule. So, um, uh, you know, the earlier the better. Um, the floodplain, that was definitely a, a, a lesson learned there just in terms of understanding and incorporating um, the cost uh, for the scoured analysis itself. And then, of course, the, uh, the expanded foundation systems. Um, that was a good lesson learned there. And then probably the most important is uh, that teamwork. Um, I think we'll all agree there, the image on the right, um, that the, uh, the rec center turned out beautifully. Uh, and I know I am uh, extremely proud to have been a part of this team and that uh, without the efforts of all the individual panelists uh, on the Zoom here today, we wouldn't have been able to achieve it. So um, working hand in hand as a team to deliver this project. Thank you. Hi everyone. Um, so I know we're coming up on the hour really soon, so I'll try to get through this as quickly as possible. My name is Stacy Chu. I'm with the American Institute of Steel Construction. Um, and like I said before, this is the award presentation for this team. So I want to make sure that we have the proper amount of time to congratulate them and let them know how awesome of a job that they did here and just how, um, you know, just 
applaud them for the work that they've done for this community. Um, but a little bit about AISC, uh, we are both a trade, association and a, a trade association and a technical institute. So we both have, you know, membership where we connect um, designers and fabricators, um, and we also put together standards as well. So I am the local DC rep uh, for AISC. Um, so if you ever have any questions, you can reach out to me. Uh, so the Ideas Awards is the um, is the annual award that we give uh, for it's the highest award uh, awarded by the um, structural steel industry um, and this year we have recognized nine different projects so the Marvin Gaye Recreation Center has won the merit award for the um, less than 15 million dollar projects category. So congratulations to them. I think we have like little reaction buttons on the bottom. So if you wanna do an applaud or send them your congratulations, give them a big round of applause. I'm sure you're actually applauding. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, applause. All right. Yeah, so um, one of the quotes from the judges, the Marvin Gaye Recreation Center celebrates in structural ingenuity as a cantilevers above an adjacent stream into the tree canopy by using angled steel columns to make use of a very challenging site. And that is Christine, I don't know how to say her last name, Freisinger, um, who is an associate principal at uh, WJE. So congratulations again to the project team. This is all, everyone that we had. Um, the owner of the uh, Department of General Services of DC, architect is iStudio Architects, um, structural engineer Simpson, Dumperts, and Heger. GC is the MCN build. Seal fabricator is Boldmark SI, who I believe is on this call today, as well as the glass facade uh, provider, which is Delray Glass. So congratulations to everybody that worked on this project. And y'all can appreciate this cute little picture that Rick sent in of him with the trophy. <laughs> he looks a little bit like a pirate here. Um, so we will move into the Q&A uh, really quick, but just so that you know, because we are coming up on time really soon, um, we do have a polling question that I will leave up for y'all as uh, the panelists lead, uh, ask, uh, answer the Q&A. Okay, awesome. Um, so I will kick off um, the questions um, and I'll kind of throw them over to the panelists as needed. Um, so the first question we received, um, building in the floodplain seems very out of the box. Um, can you talk more about how steel helped to make this possible? Um, so I think I'll, I'll touch a little bit on why we're building in the floodplain, because um, it very much was out of the box. Um, and then Matt, I think um, if you want to kind of touch base on how you know, that was actually possible, thank you, thanks to steel. Um, so high level, um, building in the floodplain really was a necessity of um, all of the existing site conditions. We looked at you know, can we tuck um, the building up into the um, northeast corner um, and just kind of get it out of the floodplain? Um, but there are a lot of existing old growth trees there and kind of some elevation changes that made it challenging. Um, the softball field to the south um, was really this kind of unique corner, getting site access, utility access, um, all seemed very strange. And so ultimately, it really was just, you know, the, tucking it in and kind of just dealing with the floodplain and um, just making it work with the design rather than against the design. Um. And Marissa, I can certainly add in, um, I know the question is, you know, why structural steel and, you know, early on in the project in you know, concept and early schematic design, we did look at alternate systems, including precast, you know, precast systems and cast in place. And uh, obviously the, the, it, it all boiled down to, you know, minimizing the foundations on the project. In order to do that, we had to have an absolute the absolute lightest structure that we could we could devise um, using uh, you know structural steel in a very efficient way and uh, keeping our slabs and you know our roof our roof systems uh, all very light metal deck systems we were able to keep the weight the weight down uh, to be able to get to get a more economical foundation system so I think why steel I mean it was uh, um, it also is a very complex geometry and steel gave steel served as a great medium that could allow us to to help make these these geometries work but I, I think fundamentally the, the the weight issue is one that it was it was really hard to you know we look at all all options and, and uh, steel was by far 
uh, the, the uh, winning vote. Great, thank you. Um, next question um, looks like it was just answered um, by Rick, the principal at ICU Architect in the chat, um, but Frank, I'll throw it over to you anyway. Um, is what is the project cost? I know that's a little bit of a, a moving target because it was essentially a recreation center, a site um, renovation, and then a trail renovation. So I'll let you elaborate on that. Yeah, Rick's uh, Rick's comment was a uh, was correct that it's all told um, about thirteen million dollars. Um, again, that entailed not only the new structure and all the uh, all the additional site work, building the plinth, all the foundations, all the uh, enhancements on that side, but then everything you know, including the new the new basketball court side, a whole new lighting structure, um, a uh, sculpture garden on that side as well. Uh, and then each one of the hubs, the three different hub sites along the trail and the, uh, and the added splash pad as well. Excellent. Um, and then I know we're running out of time. Um, one final question. If we still have, do we still have Paul Blackman on the phone um, or on the line? Oh, it looks like he had to drop off. Um, so we'll throw this one back to Matt Dow. Um, uh, one question is, can you elaborate on the lateral analysis performed on the structure for seismic wind, et cetera? Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, as far as um, modeling for the structure, primarily uh, used uh, ram, ram steel, ram frame, and ram elements. Um, not that this is a, uh, we're promoting necessarily ram international suite of software, but uh, that was the, the modeling tools that uh, we used for this project. Um, as far as lateral analysis, um, you know, it, it, the, the geometry is extremely complex and obviously uh, the, the, the modeling software that we use uh, you know, helped help to make that happen. Um, the, the lateral resistance, um, you know, was, uh, uh, we, you know, was, was complex in that we had multiple systems all working together, you know, reinforced masonry, the central core, you know, coupled with with uh, moment frames and, and brace frames um, was, was complex. Um, and, and so uh, I'm not sure if that, hopefully that answers the question, but you know, this, you know, you know uh, using RAM, RAM elements and RAM frame, um, we were able to devise the, the lateral system for the building. Um, and then one more question, um, we'll open this up to um, all three of us remaining panelists. Um, what are some of the pros and cons of the project delivery system to problem solve through the site challenges? Um, Frank, I don't know if you want to kick us off. Sure. Uh, my perspective is maybe a little biased, but ultimately um, uh, our preference is definitely the design build method and, and the delivery method. Um, you know, being a, uh, a design builder, and, and as has been mentioned earlier, with uh, budget constraints as they are, um, ultimately what this allows us to do is to to work together as a team to really maximize the components of a project that are the most important, um, so that uh, you know at least the most important to the outcomes that the project is trying to achieve, so that. Um, Every dollar that's spent is optimized um, so that we can minimize uh, expenditures on areas that, uh, that are not directly contributing to the, uh, the desired project outcome. So, um, you know, from that perspective, I think, uh, you know, Marvin Gaye Rec Center as it exists today could not have uh, happened uh, with a traditional method. Great. Um, Matt, how about you? I know you touched about this, touched on this a little bit in your presentation. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Frank. I don't think this project could have happened um, using a traditional uh, you know, design bid build approach, at least it happened with, within the budget, <laughs> the budget that we had to work with. And, you know, I'm a, I am a big fan of the design build delivery method. And I, I think there are some, it, traditionally, there have been some downsides as far as uh, maybe compromises in architecture. And I, I, I think this project is a great example of uh, being able to produce a great piece of architecture and a, a, a building that's uh, very important to the community and has been extremely successful using, uh, using a design build delivery. Um, I, I don't think I've seen a, a better example of, of a, a success um, 
than this project you know, using a design build method. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think my answer would be very similar to both of you guys. Um, I think uh, in particular, um, the screen and really designing that, being able to have um, both of you as well as the seal installer um, and Delray Glass as um, the screen installer all in the same room, all kind of walk, working together um, with their different perspectives and expertise um, was fundamental to the end product. And I don't think we would have achieved it without. Um, I'll say, having that design build method early on, you know, we would have been able to kind of overcome some of those challenges um, at an earlier stage, I think definitely um, would have been beneficial, but the end result was a very much a collaborative um, team based approach, um, which I think was ultimately very successful for the project. Um, all right, so I think that is all the time we have for questions um, I know we're about five minutes over. Um, Stacey, I'll kick it back to you for any closing remarks. Yeah, thanks so much, panelists, for answering all those questions. And I know that there were a lot more questions that were like flooding in at the very end. So what I will do is I will kind of punt those questions over to the project team and have it all answer it. And um, I'll try to get the answers out to everyone uh, one way or another, either in an email or a post about it and such. So checked in on LinkedIn or look out, be on the lookout for an email. Um, but in any case, I just wanted to leave you all with some of my contact information. Again, I am from AISC. I am the local person here in the DC and Baltimore areas um, that if you ever have any questions about structural steel, I am here to help. Uh, we do have a couple of other announcement things, um, including since this was an ideas award presentation, for those of you who are working with some pretty neat uh, structural steel projects, we really encourage you to enter it in for next year's competition. So last call will be October 15th, but if it's anything like we normally do, sometimes we let it uh, and we let latecomers enter as well. <laughs> um, so we really encourage that. Uh, another thing is our flash steel call. This is coming up, I believe, October 20th through 22nd. Um, if you need more credits, this is a really great way to do it. There is individual registration as well as group registration. And one very last announcement that we have is the 30 by 30 um, uh, challenge that we're doing to raise $100,000 in 30 days to help 30 students. So a lot of students right now, especially given, you know, the light of our economy and just what's going on with COVID, um, a lot of students are actually dropping out of school. So what we're trying to do is raise enough money to help keep them in school so that they can, you know, pursue their career as an engineer, an architect, um, so on and so forth. You know, like we really want to keep them in school and be able to graduate. <laughs> So again, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, we're really glad to have had you all here. Thank you so much to our speakers um, for presenting this awesome project. I will definitely have to try to make it out there at one point. I know it's gonna be a little bit of a, uh, a drive for me, but in any case, I would really like to go see the project with my own eyes one day. But again, thank you so much. Um, everyone take care, uh, do stay safe. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. And congratulations to the Marvin Gaye Recreation Project team again. Thank you. Thank you, Stacey. Bye-bye. Thank you, Stacey. Bye. -bye. Thank you, Stacey. Bye.